Well, this is uh, basically thrown together for uh, a another of those centennials. Uh, and in a way, it picks up from a previous one I'd done on the America program, which began in June 1917, uh, when the Germans realized that the Americans were in the war. And while it was easy to dismiss them at the time, uh, the Germans had no illusions of our industrial capabilities, and that if they didn't do something fast, uh, they were going to be... Uh, the United States had the uh, capability of eclipsing them if they didn't do something. And at the time, the Germans were on the defensive on the Western Front. And uh, there were a number of things that had to be done. One of their most ambitious ideas in the America program was to double the number of fighter units at the front and to increase production of engines to 2,500 a month which they didn't do. They were lucky to go from 14 to 1,500 a month. And uh, as far as doubling the Angstaffeln is concerned, uh, in practice, they did it. If you don't mind the fact that the number of people in planes that actually saw service in them ranged from... Uh, 75 to as little as 50% strength in practice. But another problem the Germans faced by late 1917 was the realization that the Albatross fighters that had become the backbone of their fighter force were not cutting it. Not against the competition that the Allies were cranking out, such as the SPAD-7, the Bristol fighter, the SE-5A, the Sopwith Camel, and their, uh, one of their main uh, replies to that, the Fokker F1 and later DR1 near the end of the year, had proven a bit of a disappointment in terms of <coughs> speed and quality control, and in any case was not really the tip of the spear they were expecting. As the end of the year drew near, the Germans found themselves with an opportunity on their hands to take the offensive on the Western Front one last time. Russia was out of the war. Italy, after the Caporetto, had been pushed back to the Piave River. Uh, Romania had been knocked out of the war. The Germans, a large chunk of the Eastern Front was no longer a problem for the Germans, but ironically, a front they thought they would have sewed up back in 1914, the Western Front, was still very much their problem. And with the Americans about to get into it, they had to do something fast. So they worked up an offensive to be launched on March 21st, 1918, aimed at splitting the French and uh, British armies uh, forcing their way to the channel, possibly destroying uh, Hay's contemptible little army, and perhaps forcing the French to sue for peace all before the Americans could arrive in force. And integral with that would be control of the air. Well, you're not going to get control of the air if your main fighter is the Fokker DR-1. As Manfred von Richthofen would later state at the height of the offensive, he and his flying circus would have shot down six times as many Allied aircraft if they could have just kept up with them when they disengaged. But uh, the Fokker DR-1 was too slow in level flight. So in January 1918, the Germans... Uh, announced that they would have a fighter competition and try to choose a new generation of fighter to make up a long overdue deficiency in their ranks. The Albatross D-5A was then uh, in full production and would end up being the most produced of the Albatross series, but given the basic problem of its sesquiplane configuration, reinforced or not, it was not going to be able to hold its own as their main fighter. They needed something new and something better. 
So what we'll go through are some of the contestants and how they did. Uh, the Allgemeine Elektrisches uh, Gesellschaft, AEG, had produced the D1 back in early 1917, and it had... Uh, Basically, the, the company was just making an appearance there because the D1 was as good as uh, rejected anyway. The first prototype had crashed, killing uh, Walter Hindorf, one of their leading aces from the old days. So it already arrived with a handicap. Albatross had was starting to produce a new generation of fighters. Uh, the one that came closest was the D9, which uh, tried to ease production by having a flat underside, as well as the usual rounded uh, streamlined upper surfaces. It would have been uh, powered by a higher compression version of the Mercedes D3 engine called the D3AU with an umlaut over the U, so we'll just say I for that type. It was uh, capable of 170 to 185 horsepower, and it had given the, Ger the Albatross D5A, the Faults D3A, and other German fighters that had been considered underpowered and overweight a new lease on life. But, uh, and most of the aircraft they produced would be built around it. Now, in the case of the D-9, you can't see it from this angle, but the wings involve a cellule similar to the SPAD 7 and 13 with uh, two bays, and the middle bay stiffened the uh, flying wires between them. So Albatross was finally getting rid of the sesquiplane wing. It also gave it uh, two sets of ailerons. And it seemed to have potential, but as bad luck would have it, their one prototype entry crashed on January 18th, 1918, two days before the fighter competition was supposed to get underway. Uh, Hans Henkel... The pilot miraculously survived the crack up, but at that point the only thing Albatross had on hand to uh, put up were four variations on the D-5. And it's not responding. This is the one, right? Okay. This is an operational specimen, but uh, that's basically what Albatross had to offer. Obviously, Albatross was, for all intents and purposes, out of the running. Aviatic offered a, uh, an entry which used the uh, 195 horsepower Bentz 3BO, which was an eight-cylinder engine uh, based on the Hispano Suiza 8, and uh, had potential. It was a direct-drive engine in the case of the BO. There was also a uh, BM version, which was geared, similar to the one used on the SPAD 13. And unfortunately, vibration problems with both engines would preclude its use. And Aviotic's plane was considered uh, not bad, but uh, not good enough. You'll also notice that to increase the uh, 
or to maintain a, a healthy distance between the wings, there was a small keel under the fuselage to extend it. In any case, uh, the Germans didn't think it good enough, and uh, the one with the uh, Benz BZ-3BM engine was never completed. Anthony Fokker, ever ambitious and ever out to get back his former predominance that he'd lost to Albatross, was there in force. He had worked on a number of variations off the same uh, principle of his cantilever-winged uh, projects, all under the V uh, prefix for Versuch, or uh, experimental. Uh, the V9, I think you'll recognize, in spite of its Newport-inspired wings, uh, <coughs> wing struts to be a uh, precursor of the D6, which would be a rotary-engined, uh, smaller production version of uh, the, what would be the D7. Uh, this had been originally intended for the Austro-Hungarians, but the ones that they put out ended up in German service. Uh, this was a development of it, the V11, uh, the V-13, which came in two different models, another of his V-13s, this ultimately became the D-6. He also tried uh, variations on wing configurations like the mid-wing uh, V-17, the V-20, Condor, uh, Walter Rettel and Paul G. Earnhardt came out with a, uh, with a fighter attempt, the D-1 in the autumn of 1917, which had a 100 horsepower engine. And uh, the D-2 had a more powerful rotary engine, and it made an appearance there, but it was investigated into later uh, fighter competitions, as shown here, but never quite made it. Faults came out with uh, a few ideas, including uh, a variation on the D3A, which was already entering production. The D3A had the uh, Mercedes uh, D3... AU umlaut engine, which increased some of the power. It also had a revised tailplane, revised lower wing, and had taken the machine guns, which had been buried under the, uh, the fuselage, and brought them back into the traditional position where a pilot could deal with them if they jammed, which had been a weakness of the D3. It was put into production, of course, it was the third most produced of German fighters, but uh, even at the time it was thought of as a third stringer for the America program units until they could get something better. Another false entry was the D6, which had already been introduced, like the AEG D1, back in the spring of 1917. Among the people who had originally test flown it had been Wilhelm Frankel, who, as you probably know, would be killed in action in April 1917. And yet here it was, back for one more try, but also backed up with a more powerful partner, the uh, D7, which was powered by the new Siemens Schuckert, the 160 horsepower Siemens Schuckert rotary radial engine which had an oddly geared configuration. It was 11 cylinders, and not only did the engine rotate, but so did the propeller in the opposite direction. So it could be geared down, it improved cooling, and uh, while also improving performance and uh, limiting what would have otherwise been ex excessive torque, the D7 was considered a bit, uh, its wing cellule was considered a bit on the uh, weak side, but 
Later, Faults would give it a, a two-bay wing, and that would achieve limited production uh, later in the year as the D8. LFG Roland would also introduce a new idea. Uh, it had first gained notoriety with its uh, wrapped veneer fuselage on the uh, C2, the fastest two-seater on the western front at one point, and uh, you saw a picture of that among others, courtesy of uh, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, but now they had something simpler and they thought lighter in the form of the Klinkerrumpf, basically a flying uh, Viking ship with uh, sla a sla a series of slats put together to form a what would be, in their opinion, a lighter fuselage and hopefully better performance. Uh, this was the D6. The D6A had a Mercedes engine. The D6B had the Benz B, BZ3A, which uh, offered better performance. Ultimately, 200 of the D6B would be ordered and 150 of the D6A. This is the original. Note the different tail planes and rudders that they played around with. Ultimately, this one would be chosen for the production version. This was a version, uh, the D7 had a uh, had a Benz engine intended to improve the view from the cockpit, but its performance didn't cut it well enough. And the uh, D9, uh, the D7 had a 185 horsepower Benz BZ3BO with its with six, its cylinders uh, at a 60 degree angle, it was hoped that this would improve pilot visibility over the D6, but it didn't cut it. The D9 had a 160 horsepower Siemens and Halske SH3 engine, similar to the one used on the Faults D7. Unfortunately, it became another casualty of the, uh, the uh, Adlershof uh, competition when it crashed, and it was put out of the running. Nevertheless, in later competitions, Roland would continue to uh, put out another two prototypes uh, for possibilities. Rumpler went through a number of experimental attempts at a fighter before coming up with uh, the 8D1, which, although it was not chosen in the first competition, the uh, Luftstreitkräfte apparently thought it had potential and continued to have it developed in later competitions, and a small production batch was to be ordered later in the war, but they they did not get out in time to see operational uh, testing. Schindelanz, best known earlier in the war for their wooden airships, had put together a wooden fighter that uh, also had a Mercedes engine and uh, according to uh, to the testing, uh, gave an unspectacular performance. In spite of that, they would try putting out a triplane version in May 1918. Needless to say, that didn't make it either. Uh, Siemens Schuckert, which up till now had been best known for uh, putting out a, a copy of the new Pore 11, came out with something original to use the uh, Siemens and Halske SH-3 engine. Originally the D-2 was developed into the D-3 and it was in this form. 
that it uh, saw use at the competition. This too was chosen for limited production for evaluation because it had a spectacular rate of climb and it, was, it gave a fairly good performance in level flight. Uh, this is a this is a uh, w partially white painted uh, D3 that uh, entered service with Jagdstaffel 19 and was uh, flown by Walter Gutsch, one of their aces. You can see the, uh, the DR1s that normally equipped uh, Yasta 19 at that time. Unfortunately, Gutsch would be killed soon before he could really uh, put this thing to full use. Nevertheless, uh, enough were built to enter service in the spring of 1918 with Jagdish Vater II. It is known to have equipped at least three of their Staffeln, uh, 12, uh, 15, and 19. Unfortunately, being a rotary engine, it was very dependent on castor oil for its... Uh, for lubrication and the castor bean was not exactly a common occurrence in Germany so they had to come out with an ersatz uh, replacement called uh, resinus which just uh, could not stand up to heat the way normal castor oil could and a lot of these engines were just burning up and seizing up particularly during the summer Another uh, German manufacturer, Remag, would later put out its own version of the Siemens and Halske engine, and oddly enough, it stood up better than the original. Nevertheless, uh, ultimately the Siemens Schuckert SSW D3 would see little use in frontline squadrons, but with its uh, excellent climb, it was uh, kept further back for use as an interceptor against, say, the bombers of independent force. They also came up with a version which used the same wing as the lower wing of the D3 as the upper wing. It uh, sacrificed some of the climb performance but was faster in level flight, and that was the D4. And a few of those saw service. One of them actually uh, got to the front with uh, Yasta 12, and I believe it was probably flown by its commander, uh, uh, Becker. Here's a more typical one that's used by Kampfeinsitzer Staffel 4B in the interceptor role, for which it's best known. It certainly had the potential to have been one of the best fighters of the war if only its engine could have uh, gotten better lubricant. Which leaves us to investigate the one standout of the January competition. This is the Fokker V11. And it was uh, it was tested by a number of pilots uh, for most of them, uh, Manfred Freiherr von Richthofen, who reported the thing to have a lot of potential, but he found it tricky, unpleasant to fly, and directionally unstable at a dive. <coughs> uh, one thing about uh, Richthofen, he was, there was sincerity in his outspokenness, and one thing about Fokker, the businessman, if someone of Richthofen's uh, eminence had suggestions, he would respond. But you're looking at the original version of a plane that would soon change everything over the Western Front. One of the main, among the things Fokker would do with this was to extend the fuselage another 40 centimeters. He also experimented with some tails, in this case the uh, the Fokker V-22 and here's a better look at uh, the stabilizer he added but he later came out with something simpler uh, 
this <coughs> triangular stabilizer proved to be adequate to do the job, and he also moved it a little off center to counter the torque. How much of a difference did this make over the V11? Well, Richthofen was impressed. In fact, every German pilot who flew it was impressed. The thing suddenly became a delight to fly. When it became operational, uh, Rudolf Berthold mentioned that even flying it with his crippled right hand, he had perfect control over the plane. Yeah, that redesign had made a difference. It was put into production without further ado as the Fokker D7 and began to arrive at Jagdstaffel 10 in April 1918. Manfred was, could hardly wait to see it become fully operational and to use it in combat. He was destined never to do so and ended up, uh, here's an experimental version with a uh, a somewhat off-centered uh, four-bladed prop, but otherwise you can see D7 written all over it. That would end up being the main German fighter. That was the good news of Adlershof, which lasted from January 20th to February 18th, uh, 1918, with this being the winner, and immediately put into production not only at Fokker, but the Germans ordered uh, another 200 to be built without further ado by Albatros, and another 200 to be built by Ostalbatros Werke, which was their eastern subsidiary. It was, uh, they were to be built <coughs> for two. 25,000 marks each with a 5% uh, royalty going to Fokker for everyone that Albatros made. Now, I suppose you're all familiar with Fokker quality control, which would assert itself to some degree on the Fokker D7. Besides the irony of having to build a Fokker design under license, Albatros and OAW produced... Uh, D7s that were uh, of better quality than the Fokker originals. I may add that there were no plans for the D7 available when they were ordered to produce these. Uh, Albatros had no uh, recourse but to break it down and reverse engineer their own version, which in practice was not quite... Uh, the same specification as the original, but it was the best they could do, and they did rather well. So that would become the new mainstay of the uh, Luftstreitkräfte. But it wasn't until early to mid-May that the Fokker D7 was ready to go into action in force. Uh, the Kaiserschlag began on March 21st. At the time, the tip of the German spear in the air was three uh, Jagdgeschwader, one, two, and three, equipped with DR-1s, backed up by a shaft consisting of Albatros D-5s, D-5As, even D-3s, and Faults D-3s and D-3As. There was a little sprinkling of in April of Siemens Schuker Werke D3s, and that was pretty much it until May. Now, when the Fokker D7 appeared, it made a, an instant impression, but by that time, the Germans were already well into their offensive, and it was not going quite as well as hoped. And at this point, uh, However much uh, of a problem the D7 would be to the Allies, don't forget they weren't exactly resting on their laurels. Good as the D7 was, the air was now full of not only camels and bristles and SE5As, but Sopwith Dolphins, Spad 13s, and new aircraft in the wings. And 
Another thing the Germans had to do after the fighter competition at Adlershof was hedge their bets. The Roland D6 was put into uh, production and allocated to some of the backup units like Yasta 23B or Yasta 35B, where the pilots, some of whom had gotten to fly the Fokker D7, naturally found them wanting in comparison. These planes were not bad, but the D7 pretty much spoiled it on everyone else. They, they were very aware of the fact that they were settling for second best. And uh, that was pretty much the situation as it would be by the end of May 1918. At least the Germans were ready to displace the Albatross D5A finally in favor of the Fokker D7. But in spite of the fact that they would have three more fighter competitions in an attempt to get that quantum leap going, well, the D7... It's somewhat debatable of how much of a quantum leap from the DR-1 it had been. The, uh, structurally speaking, the, DR, the DR-1 had been a quantum leap. It was the D-7 that got the formula right. But even so, I'd say it was a case of, in retrospect, we can say it's a case of too little, too late. Uh, one more thing, by the way, the uh, in this painting... Uh, Becker's uh, D4 is shown leading a uh, D3 in the foreground is flown by uh, Alfred Greffen and uh, two Fokkers from Yasta 12 into action. How often that occurred, we can only speculate.